So I'm Malaysian, I'm first generation. I came when I was 10 with my older brother and my parents. In this episode of the Level Asian podcast, we're chatting to Zoe Lowe, General Manager of July. I guess I didn't see a lot of Asian women around me succeed and be in management roles. So when you don't see something, you don't really know that it's possible. When we migrated and I kind of traveled a bit more, I started to see women in leadership roles, women of color in leadership roles, which made a huge difference. That is how it started for me, being like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. Having diverse ways of leading is now very widely accepted and encouraged. Strong leadership is kind of like what you see in the army, right? Like you've got this strong male with power that's commanding over people and yelling. They use that a bit in corporate as well. I am the younger generation, so I'm starting to understand that that doesn't really work with us. We're so much more in tune with our emotions. I don't think a leader should be just strong and not being in tune with the emotions with their team. I think you can be both emotionally in tune and emotionally intelligent and Mm -hmm. stoic at the same time time. My assumption growing up was if you cry and you show strong displays of emotion, you're weak. It's actually stronger for you to face your emotions head on. So Asian for me to say this. It's so efficient (laughs) because otherwise you will have to deal with it maybe five, ten years down the track. Yeah, and it's all all done now. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now onto today's episode. So what was the digital nomad life for you? Okay, back then it was not as popular as it is now. So yeah, it's like quite didn't exist, unknown. Right? Yeah, I don't know when you did it, but I did it. 2019. Yeah, so I did it 2015. Um, Whoa, you did it early. Yeah, really early. Long story short, I met my now husband at work and then he was like, I'm leaving to go and travel, but work at the same time. Like I'll contract while I'm overseas. Do you want to come? And I said, what? Like I had no idea what he was talking about. So he explained the whole concept, which is, you know, you work digitally. So you don't need to be in one place. Obviously now that's so common after COVID. Um, and he said, How, why don't you come? And we'd been dating maybe through, not even maybe six months. Uh, and like any uh, young, crazy 20 year old, I was like, yeah, of course I'll come with you. And so I like quit my job, sold, then started to get some clients. Um, and I contracted so uh, doing social and content marketing while I, while I traveled with him. So that's how it started. And right. it, it was yeah. great. We went to Bali. Of course and, you yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it, oh, oh, it, oh, it was really soft entry into the lifestyle because my parents were living there at the time as well. Your parents were living in Bali? Yeah, so my parents, um, yeah, my I have really hippie parents actually. Wow. Yeah, so my dad is like a um, bamboo architect. So he specializes in sustainable Yep. Uh, buildings made out of bamboo. Okay. And so he was doing that there and mum was living with him obviously. And um, so we were like, why not we join? And then we start there and then see where we go. And then we, the whole plan was to do it for like a year and a half. Mm. And then it kind of went uh, south a little bit because we broke up okay. <laughs> in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, so we went, we traveled, like we did a few Asian cities and then we broke up in Hong Kong. Um, I came back to Melbourne, he did two. And then we stayed broken up for the total of one month. And then, you got <laughs> and back then we together. got back together. <laughs> mm, you made for each other. Yeah, I, I think that was when we knew um, that we were made for each other. Yeah. Because you make the decision. Everyone has different philosophies on this, but I think it's really nice to have mm. like an exit clause in a relationship after a certain amount of time. And then if you actually choose after a mini breakup to come back together, you're actually making a far more um, considered informed decision mm-hmm. so because you, you already know what they're like whereas at the start you don't and then you could feel stuck stuck and resentful mm-hmm. but when we made the decision to get back together it was very like we actually knew each other quite well so we were like this is it you were very clear that you guys were made for each other in the sense that well you- I, I didn't know until we'd broken up and had a lot of time to think like you know you know someone's full strengths all their weaknesses yeah. um and then yeah i was like this is this is it like i i, I think we're we balance each other out really well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. Distance makes the heart grow fonder. I actually, with my missus, I'm not sure you knew that we were on and off for quite a long time. No, too. I didn't know that. Yeah. So Early wrong? I would say that we dated for like about six months and I can't even remember because we were like mates mm. and we were work mates. 
then became mates. Yeah. And then became more than mates. Then became like, all right, let's do it. Girlfriend, boyfriend. Saw each other for a little while. And then we're like, you know what? This is just too much. And we kind of like stopped. For yeah. six months. It wasn't six months. It was just like, I don't even know when it was. It was just, it was weird because like, it was so on and off mm-hmm. all the time. So one moment I'm like, yeah, I don't think we should do this. And then the next moment she's like, yeah, I don't like you as much as I thought I did. Yeah. So it just kept going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then um, after a while we we still kept talking to each other. We still came back to each other. Every time there was like a tough time in our life, we'd mm-hmm. always confide in each other. So we kind of realized, you know what? Like we've seen enough people. We have spoken to, a, we've had a lot of, we don't have that many relationships, but we've made relationships, we've started relationships and we realized that, you know what, we're the one. You're the Same one. Same as you? Yeah, it, it, yeah, similar. Yeah. I just think when I was younger, I thought it'd be a lot more linear. You know, you date, you get engaged and you get married. It's like a fairy tale. It's 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 second best <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, that's what you think. But yep. uh, I actually think the beauty of it is when you accept that things don't have to be linear. There is no con- conventional thing. And sometimes the best part of relationships come out through, well, a lot of the times the best ones come out of adversity and mm. going through things like breakups and really traumatic things together. So, mm. yeah. yeah. Like the time where I had to pick her up when she was drunk and didn't know what was going on and vomiting everywhere. Oh, yeah, no. Those times like that. Yeah. Right. You're talking about that, right? <laughs> oh, right. But still a bonding experience. That is still a bonding experience. Who's adversity, huh? Yeah. So yeah. much adversity. Hey, my car. <laughs> Never my the car same again. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you were, doing, you were doing marketing whilst you were traveling? Yes. So that's your background, isn't it? Yes, marketing? It, it was. Okay. It is. And it, it is my foundation skill set. Yes. Right. And you were, I believe you said you were working in tech, uh, sort of in your previous life, so to speak. Yes. So we met each other at Coinjar. Yep. They were very lucky. Sorry, they were very nice. And I was very fortunate that they let me leave the full-time role, but contract while I was overseas. Oh, okay. So, so they enabled the digital nomad life, right. which was amazing. They were yeah. quite progressive then, I imagine. Very. I mean, the crypto, crypto in 20... 20- 14, really. Yeah, that That's, wasn't even mainstream. It was crazy. Yeah, I don't even know how I, well, I know, but <laughs> it's kind of crazy how I ended up there because especially now being in a luggage brand. Yeah. That's what I yeah. want to know. Yeah, it's you just- went from something really different to, usually people would probably, I imagine it would flip the other way, like because of crypto being so big now, well, sort of come down a little bit, but yeah. like moved into places like this, whereas you left it and then you like moved into- And then I went back mainstream. again. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so like we speak, so we just spoke about not things not being linear. And I would say when I look back and I, I'm, all, I'm only like what, 10, 12 years into my career. Mm. So very short time, but yeah, it has been very non-linear. So the story is I graduate, um, I did well at school. I was very academic but I wanted to do a course that didn't require a great enter, um, which was a bachelor of communication. Then I entered it and it was actually a personality entry. You have to do an, an in-person interview and that's how you get oh, in. Oh, do you? Yeah, that's how you get into the course. Okay. So I got in, did it, got a grad um, graduate role at WorkSafe, which is a government agency. And they do, you know, the rotations like any other grad program. I did it and I was quite miserable. Yeah. Um, And I couldn't figure out why. I was pretty much got to a point where I was crying after work every day. And I was like, I was so frustrated. I was like, maybe I don't really know why. And I think I finally figured out it was because I was extremely bored and so frustrated about being bored. In hindsight, it makes perfect sense. Mm. I enrolled into a um, evening classes that I paid for myself for digital marketing, which at that time was quite newish coming up. And, um, and I started looking for different roles and there was all this other stuff that happened. I fell in love with this guy in Malaysia and I tried to leave (laughs) Australia to go and be with him. (laughs) Yeah, it was complicated, but you know, while I was catching up with a friend one day, he said, Hey, um, why don't you try joining a startup? And it it never occurred to me because that's not really something they talk to you in your careers. Mm. counselor when you're in high school and he said oh there's a startup that I know called Coinjar and they're looking for a digital marketing junior you could probably do it um do you want an intro and I said what do they do oh they like you know they're a crypto platform bitcoin platform back then Mm. and I was was like what's bitcoin and um (laughs) so I went down this huge rabbit hole um I went to, you know, the founder was doing a talk. So I did like a little research, like, yeah, like a recon session and I went to his talk and then I did the interview and I said, look, like, 
let's just give it a go. And I think at that time I had, I had actually a job offer in Malaysia and I, it didn't work out and I was very close to leaving. Um, and so things just kind of lined up really well. Mm-hmm. And then I took that job with Coinjar and, and then I just started there. Well, what happened to the job in Malaysia? Oh, Sorry, I was just confirming. Are you in Malaysia at this time or are you in Australia? No, I was here. I oh, just yes. fell in love with some guy in Malaysia. Oh. <laughs> so from a timeline perspective, the yeah. guy you, mar- you are married to now, this was pre him? Pre him, pre him, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then so you were gonna consider going to Malaysia and like what happened to the job there? Like you said okay. it didn't work out. It, the contract was rescinded because my security cl- clearance wasn't granted because I'm born in Malaysia. It was a very high level job in a commission, in the Australian commission. Oh. And I think there was a HR screw up. It's like one of those moments where I didn't do anything wrong at all. You know, when you try so hard to make something work, um, I spoke like fluent Malay in my interview. I gave them my passport, which says my place of birth was uh, Kuala Lumpur. Huh. And it's just one of those moments where I said, I tried so hard because I was so in love with this guy that I'd met in Malaysia mm. during one of my trips home. I sold everything. So I'd quit that, quit the job, got that. And like on, so I'd gotten, I had my fail. I was just about to have my farewell party on the Saturday and my flight was on the Monday. So I'd sold everything, packed everything up, had that awful moment with my mom where she cried and she was like, I don't want you to go. <laughs> uh, and then they called me and they said, your contract's been rescinded. And I, I couldn't believe it because I was like, yeah. I'd done everything and yeah. we we're so close to be, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a long distance, but when you're in a long distance relationship and you finally get to a point where you actually make it happen, yes and it doesn't happen. Oh, I was crushed. Yeah, I bet you were. It was really bad, yeah. Yeah. Um, But then the coin jar thing worked out. So um, in hindsight, it makes sense. But at the time, awful, like really awful. I guess things happen for a reason as well. Yes. And and how did it go with, we obviously know what happened with the relationship, but like how did it impact the relationship? Oh yeah, we broke up. We just never got back together. Because like of that? yeah, yeah. Really? It's, it's really like sad. You, you weren't like sort of going he goes, Oh, I'll come to Australia or you we go to Malaysia. We were so young. We were so young and I think when something that inte- I, yeah, we didn't fight for it. Yeah. Right. Which is really sad. Obviously now hindsight, me being married to my husband, I, I understand and he's so happy now and he's in a relationship. But when you at the time I think we were what, early, very early twenties, twenty, twenty one. Um, mm. yeah, it was tough. Yeah. You're like, why would, yeah. you know? I, I just know what you're like, what you went through. Cause I, I had a high school a sweetheart and I was 15 and it's just like, it's so fairy tale. Like everything you do is just like- So intense. I know it's so intense. Puppy so, love. I, I love it actually. Yeah. I miss it. Yeah, it's <laughs> really nice. Cause yeah. now me and my missus is just like, we're just so grown up. Like it's just like- It's so domestic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you want for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go out there because- I don't know where you want to go. We always have this conversation. <laughs> don't even buy presents for each other. But when, when it came to like, you know, when I was like really young, it was just like, oh, we'll think about every it's anniversary. three month anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> buy roses, turn up to surprise her, drive her everywhere. Now I'm just like, can you just take an Uber or a taxi somewhere? Like, <laughs> just, it's, but yeah, you miss those moments, right? I do miss it, yeah, it's yeah. very nice. So you, so you didn't fight for it, but then obviously things worked out because you ended up working for Coinjar. Yeah, and that's where I met my husband. Right, yeah. and then because this is not a podcast about Zoe's love story. But funny, <laughs> hey, funny. I people want to know. Hey, no, 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 if you want to go down that rabbit it, hole. We can laugh about it now, right? I mean. But things, yeah. things happen, like I said, things happen yeah. for a reason. So you, yeah. worked, you worked for Coinjar and then how did how did July sort of come into, was that July was right after that? No. Or you did a whole bunch of other things? <laughs> I did a whole bunch. Like, yeah, so then I did the Coinjar thing yeah. and then I did the Nomad thing and then we broke up, then I came back and then I took a couple of full-time roles, mm. um, uh, always in tech, mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, always in tech. And then one night um, my friend was like, hey, I'm going to be a speaker at this function and it's called fuck up night. You should come and you know, why don't you come and listen? And um, fuck up night is uh, like a community night where people come and speak about their biggest fuck up in their life. So you have like two or three speakers. So my friend was speaking and so I went to support her and um, it was great. And one of the other speakers, was Ethan, who is the founder of the July of right. July, and uh, I didn't I didn't know he was speaking. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about mm. July. And after his and it was very early days of the business, and this would have been like, yeah four years ago. And when he finished speaking, I turned 
next door to my, uh, I turned to my husband and I said, wow, that guy is like awesome. I, reckon, <laughs> I thought you were about I'm, to say, that guy's really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, oh my God. Like he's just, I feel like I'd be mates with him. Like, you know, when you, I was like, he's you cool. I would him. like, yeah, like I get it. Like when he's so passionate about the business, it's contagious. And then Aaron was like, oh, you should talk to him. And I was like, nah, you know, that's luggage. I work in tech. Um, <laughs> so it, it's so funny because then a few months later, my friend was like, Hey, like he took a job at July and he was saying, you should chat to us. We are looking for marketers. And I said, I've never marketed physical products. I've only marketed tech. Um, and it's, it's just a different marketing stack that you you're specializing mm. as you guys know. And, um, he said, why don't you just chat? And I said, Oh, fine. Like I'll do a coffee. Um, and so on a Saturday morning around the corner from here, we did a coffee. I met Richard and Eighth, and it turned out to be a job interview. That uh, you didn't realize. I didn't realize. Job. I think, you know, naturally you start asking people what they do and yeah. that we got more and more deep, like deep into like, you know, the craft of marketing and what was involved and about their business. And I came away from it feeling really um, like invigorated. Like I have always loved founders. I love working for founders because the passion is so palpitating. Like it really drives you to, to go above and beyond and really challenges how far someone can get deep into your craft. Cause there's a really big purpose and lots of passion. Anyway, so we came away from that and it wasn't really a clear outcome because I wasn't quite sure what kind of person they were still looking for and mm. neither were they. Anyway, six months later, I signed the contract and I joined them. Mm. Uh, and it was a very, as a marketing manager, and it was a super steep learning curve. So that would have been three years and six, seven months now, mm -hmm. that, yeah, ago that I joined. And it's been wild. This since. is like the longest you've been with one organization as well. Yes, yeah, okay. really, so which is, that. yeah. And I, I love it. Like it is by far the best job I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and I could not have planned it. I, I didn't plan it. And why is that? Why is it the best job? The first thing is you work with people who are really passionate and people who are just people who are really good at their work. Um, our team is young, they're passionate, they're so determined and ever, and the, the product is great. The founders are amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that really matters because that's the day to day. And also when you join a startup and when it's on this insane growth trajectory, you're personal and professional development is just insane. Mm -hmm. Like I've learned what I feel is like a decade of mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. and like experience stuffed into three and a half years. And that's what I always say when I interview people, I say like, it's not gonna be easy. Like startup life is quite chaotic, but you'll fit in like five years in a really like in one year sometimes mm -hmm. because you're, you're thrown into the deep end. It takes a very specific type of person to thrive in that environment. And often I find um, if they are the right person for it, it it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like you just, I have, I find the job so rewarding because I have seen multiple people I've hired just like shoot through the roof with like how amazing they can perform in a startup environment. It's- I, I can relate and I'm sure- I was about to say. To, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even with doing Level Asian and stuff like that and like Viv's probably nodding in the background there, but like, cause we're technically small businesses. You know, Davey's been doing his business for six, seven we're, years. We're technically startups We're too, technically yeah. startups in a lot of ways and it's just chaos. Like you said, it's, yeah. it's like, it's <laughs> crazy. It's so, like, yeah. it's chaos. Like, a like what am I doing? Like, yeah, like one day, like we're doing <laughs> this we and doing? then <laughs> and it's happening, right? We're building a podcast studio and then like within like a few weeks, there's a podcast studio all of a sudden. So um, as soon as someone has an idea, you know, and then you've got the team, of course, who then have to execute on it. It's like very similar. I think, yeah. And, and the fact that we meet so many guys um, and it's like one big family and we're just growing together. That's the part where mm. I can relate so much. It's like, you know, these guys that started with me or and girls that started with me that uh, they were just young people that didn't know what they wanted, but now they have such like strong passion about what they're trying to do and how many people they're impacting in terms of the cli our clients. I know it's accounting, it's a bit boring, but- It matters. A, yeah, it matters. It matters and, and it changes a lot of people. And, and now I'm just like, wow, like we've got this one big family, we're growing so fast. Every year we're like close to doubling in size. Um, and we've got all these new people, new faces. And now like the people that we've been working with for the last five years is like managing people, mm -hmm. which I never would have thought that we would be doing. Which yeah. is what you're doing now. Yeah. 
in a lot of ways. Yeah. Do you see yourself doing that back in the day? Like obviously going from marketing to like general manager. I think I smashed a lot of self-limiting beliefs in this in this role, like Agile. Yeah, I, I didn't see myself at this level. Uh, and it's quite sad to say, but actually there was one conversation I had with Richard and Eighth, and it is both ama- it was both amazing, but also when I reflect, it's quite sad because they said to me, they're like, we sometimes feel like we see more potential in you than you see in yourself. Mm. And it was like, obviously that's very nice to hear because you're like, wow, my bosses believe in me so much. But personally you're like, wow, I have been capping my own, my, my, my own potential. My own potential. Mm. And it's really, really sad. Um, and, and But it, it's a journey, right? And you just kind of try and smash more ceilings and smash the beliefs as you go on and on. And mm. you're just like, look, let's just keep trying. Mm. But yeah, it is managing people is really incredibly challenging. And I think you don't really know it until you get to it. So I, I the team is now 35 full-time employees, but really it's uh, including the casual retail staff about 60, mm-hmm. 65. And I consider all of them under my care and it is such a huge responsibility. A lot of people, you will, when you're younger, you'll just flippantly say, oh, I'm going to manage people. Like, cause that's <laughs> what you're yeah. meant. Like, you know, that's, I guess you think that that's really where you should be going, but when you actually do it and if you want to do it well, the sense of responsibility can get really overwhelming. Like I find it really overwhelming because you always are trying to balance like all different priorities all at once. The business priorities, you're trying to be a great boss. You're trying to also care for them as people. Um, and having the for, foresight of what, what's ahead for the business and the team and for them, especially if they're younger than you. So yeah, it's been incredibly challenging, but so rewarding, mm. so rewarding. Like for the limiting beliefs, cause I, I kind of want to like dig into that a little bit. Cause I feel like a lot of Asians have that problem. I mean, 100%. that's not even an Asian problem, but it's like, you know, it's like a lot of people have that problem, but let's just talk it because we're talking the context of Asians as well. Like, why do you feel like, did you, have you explored that a little bit about why you felt you had that? limiting belief. Yeah, where does that stem from? Yeah. Uh, yes, I actually have, I spend a lot of time on this. Um, and I think it is probably because um, my parents, so I'm Malaysian, I'm first generation. I came when I was 10 with my older brother and my parents. And my dad is an architect and he is like a professional and he went to uni, but I didn't, ha- I guess I didn't see a lot of people who like women, Asian women, around me like succeed and be in management roles Uh, it was just not i guess it's like i didn't see it yeah so when you don't see something you don't really know that it's possible it takes someone with great observation and great like you would be amazing to to be able to think of that Mm. as a possibility without being without seeing it very imaginative person right so for me um i think that was really a big part like i hadn't seen it um as a young person but then when we migrated and I kind of traveled a bit more, I started to see more, right? You see more um, women in leadership roles. You see more women of color in leadership roles, which made a huge difference. And then you see, you start to see younger women of color who look like me in leadership roles. And that is like how it started, how it started for me being like, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. Right. Um, So that's like, societally and like more conceptually um, how I broke that. But also I think culturally our pair, my parents perhaps did fall. They, I would say compared to your standard Asian parents, they're a lot more progressive, but they perhaps did encourage and kind of thought had limited views of what success meant. And it wasn't until, and so, you know, when I was growing up, I had very conventional views, you know, you get a full-time job, you work for a very reputable company, you know, you, you do all the things, you get married, you have kids, um, and you don't do anything out of, out of that very linear um, lifestyle. But as a, and, and this is the beauty of having migrated here and kind of traveling and meeting more people is you, you kind of understand that success means very different things to different people and you can't just copy and paste. Mm-hmm. Like it's so deeply tied to who you are and what your values are mm-hmm. and it requires so much introspection for you to actually do it in a way that honors you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that, I went through this whole journey about that, being like, well, what is it that I actually want? Um, how do I achieve it? And it was, it's been messy, but moving forwards always. Did you, as in, when you say journey, do you, did you actually have conversations? Did you sort of seek out help? Um, 
Like what were some of the things that you actually did? It's a combination of a few things. So um, great family, like supportive family who would uh, – supportive family, very supportive husband, supportive friends, um, lots of reading and like Googling and kind of just exposing yourself to what's out there. And probably the clincher is um, doing therapy, okay. which can absolutely change the game. Like just learning how to reframe things properly changed the game for me. And it started off <laughs> to tie it all back together when we broke up, um, when my husband and I broke up for that short time when we were dating, um, I couldn't get myself out of the emotions of the breakup. Like I just, I just couldn't step out of it, mm. out of the emotion. And, you know, you can talk to friends and you can talk to family, but they have a very vested interest in your health and well-being, And they are also very invested in the relationship you have with them in continuing. So they're not going to be as brutally honest and mm. um, approach the, re- the conversation with as much candor as a psychologist would who is paid f- for your men, like for you, for, for your best, like with you and you only in mind, they don't care. The relationship continues really. Mm-hmm. And so I just had this, so wow. Well, yeah, after we broke up, um, I was also going through a whole heap of stuff as you do in your mid twenties, right? And I just went to once, I think after the first session, it was the first time I was like, I was very honest with her and it was unbelievable. Just having an objective viewpoint and I mean, I, I con- continually saw her to try and work through a few things and unbelievable, so, unbelievable. So that first session. you I felt it from the first session. Right. So what did, um, are you able to share what you sort of talked about yeah. or unpacked? Like so what was the profound a, moments? A lot of it actually, um, I had a really great childhood and amazing upbringing, like very stable, but it still kind of goes back to your upbringing. Like I find it's, it's the same as well with professional coaching. If you do it, um, which is a little different to psychology, uh, psychologists, but they often go back to your childhood and it always starts from that. And then it kind of goes through um, the most um, memorable and impactful memories that you have. And then what the, what the meanings are that are attached to that. Mm-hmm. And then there's also things. So we work through a lot of my um, assumptions and beliefs, uh, what they were grounded in, mm-hmm whether or not I still believed in it as an adult and whether I wanted to take it into my life. Yeah. And we we did a whole heap of other things too, right? Like, um, you know, learning to think for myself um, and process emotions. That was a big one. And I think actually I have quite a few Asian friends, of course, and it seems to be a trend actually. And especially now when I'm seeing my friends have kids and they are reading these books to their children, it's like, Le- teaching them how to identify emotions. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So they're like, I'm they're teaching. Old right now, yeah, so. they yeah. have these okay. books now to teach kids like how to identify what they're feeling and then to mm-hmm. go deeper mm-hmm. um, and explain and communicate that. Um, I kind of had to do that as an adult, and I think, unfortunately, I still think a lot of people haven't done that before as adults. So we did that huge exercise of being like, well, what, like, can you identify the emotion? Because. I think when I was um, in my 20s, uh, the only emotions I could really identify were like, (laughs) I'm sad, I'm happy, and I'm angry. Yeah. But really there's a lot more, this this is a huge spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. There's this thing called the feelings wheel, um, which is you kind of identify which emotion, you start with one and then it kind of encourages you to go, like, let's go further. Like, okay, well, if you're angry, are you you like, like no, well, are you frustrated? Oh, okay. Or are so you, like, the, what kind of angry you... are you, right? Mm. And by working that out, you can work out how to solve it. Is that what you mean? Well, by working, I guess um, a lot of it, and I'm, st- I'm still working on it, right? Yeah. Like it's still a continual thing where you try and identify the emotion. I think the general sentiment is you try and spend more time figuring out like why you mm. feel it. Mm-hmm. It's less about solving it. And mm. I think the key perhaps in solving it is delving deeper into why. So mm. philosophical, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's this is interesting. cool, I love this. No, yeah, no, yeah no, it's I, interesting, uh, that's why I'm asking. Well, I guess when I was younger, you know, like um, you're, especially if you're first generation, like going to a psych is very like taboo. Yeah. 
But I don't know. To me, I don't, I don't even know if it's taboo. I just don't know people even think about. It's it. not a yeah, thing. It's not a thing, but it should be because you go to a doctor when you're sick, or you go to a, a physio when you mm. feel like your muscles not working. And if you're stuck mentally on a problem, yeah. just go to a person who specialises in fixing that problem. Mm. Why would you torture yourself, mm. right? I mean, I understand actually. Like it is, um, it's actually quite expensive, and it, they are very busy now, especially after COVID. But if you can, it's fantastic because you kind of shortcut your way through it and you no, have, yeah, it's I, amazing right right think about it if you are mentally struggling mm. and you're not you it, what, what's going to happen you're going to be inefficient you're not going to be able to do what you need to do you're probably even going to cause problems in your relationships that yes. you have with people mm -hmm. um you could even lose your job mm -hmm. and if you just went and saw someone and that could help you faster mm. then you can go back to your everyday life mm. I, I i personally see it as it's not even when you have a problem, it's also like every milestone that you achieve, it's gonna change your life. And there's so much richness that you can unpack about yourself in these moments. Like, you know, um, when you become a, when you, sorry, when you get married, when you have a child, if you go through a divorce, if you go through a breakup, um, if you have a friendship that is like deteriorating, if work is like freaking you out and you're, you know, I know they kind of all, problems but some not right like it's a good and bad it is like it is mm -hmm. a missed opportunity to learn more about yourself it depends on your philosophy on life but i think you know why would you miss out on this richness of learning more about yourself in really like intense moments of your life mm -hmm. and milestones this episode is sponsored by mill on wines mill on wines are an award-winning family-owned winery located in the renowned wine regions of barossa valley Eden Valley and Clare Valley, presenting a fusion of vineyards that seamlessly infuse new technologies with old world traditions. Their vineyards capture the essence of each region, delivering distinctive wines with complex flavour profiles in small batches, a minimalistic approach that allows the fruit to speak for itself. Explore their range at www.millonwines.com.au. Now back onto the episode. There's um, something magical about um helping yourself through conversation because it's like if you don't talk about it like you might have it swimming in your head but it's like the act of actually having the conversation about it helps a lot because I, I find myself sometimes like we talk about it and sometimes before we even get let the other person respond we've already we already sort of like solve the problem in a lot of ways or we sort of know why and when you were saying this and i've been actually thinking about i, I don't i don't um see a therapist but i've been thinking about it just because I, I give you an example. So, um, and I think a lot of like male Asians can probably relate. I don't know if your parents were like this, right? Which is the, um, especially Chinese, I used to get told this and I love my parents, this is all they knew, but they, I, I used to like, you know, if you cry as a kid, um, you know, and this was like, whether you were like, you know, sort of under 10 or even just, you know, in high school. And I, I used to get told, you're like, um, basically in Chinese is like, um, you're, you're a male, like you're a guy, guys, mm -hmm. boys don't cry. Like yeah. used to get that kind of response, right? And because you're a child, you all you know is like, that's fact. Mm. But what it does do is it causes you to um, sort of bury or internalize your emotions. And then it's the recognition issue of not knowing how to deal with your emotions when they do come up every now and again. Because it's actually, a, in my opinion, it's an unhealthy thing to not be able to identify your emotions and then be able to do something about it. Yes. And I think that comes with, um, at least from an Asian experience, shame. Cause it's like, all right, well, if I'm a guy and I cry, it's a very shameful thing to do. Yeah. And then it's a, it's a problem, right? Why are you looking at me? Because <laughs> <'Cause> he's crying <laughs> up there, bit. No, 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 no. It's because <laughs> it's just in the last month, it's been a very emotional. I've been getting married and you know, I've been crying a lot. Uh, we had our one year anniversary. <laughs> I, but I kind of used to not cry that much. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I like, think you're just becoming more in tune. It's good. Yeah, I think it's, it's good. There's a lot more clarity. Anyway, my, my point of that is I now struggle with, and I say this as well, it's like I'm quite um, guarded about these types of emotions, right? Like yeah. I can feel it, but it's like quite hard for me to just like tip over the edge and like say, for example, cry um, or, yeah. or feel like very strong emotions. And so like I'm, I've been almost in certain ways growing up being trained to be more stoic. But because yes. of that, uh, great for leadership because it's like when shit hits the fan, I'm just like, you know, sort of like zoned in. I know what to do. But for like more emotional, like let's just talk your personal relationships or, 
you know, life events that happen that are a big deal. It's like, I'm, I'm always sort of like the don't get too high, don't get too low type thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I don't know what you guys I'm, think. I'm gonna challenge you there. Yeah. Is it really good for la- leadership? Well, that's the thing. So that's the assumption. And this goes into fuck, yeah. such a therapy session, but yeah. yeah. So good. Okay. I, I, yeah. So in the challenging thing, I think you can be both emotionally in tune and emotionally intelligent and mm-hmm. stoic at the same time. Yeah. And I think that was something that I learned because my assumption growing up was if you cry and you show strong displays of emotion, you're weak and yeah. you are vulnerable. Correct. Uh, that flipped on its head when my when I got married and um, my husband, who is very emotionally intelligent and, and very in tune with his emotions, say it's actually stronger for you to face your emotions head on. Right, it's not the absence so of it. It's yeah, it's it's mm. your ability to just process them and and be brave about it. And actually, it's <laughs> so Asian for me to say this. It's so efficient. Because <laughs> otherwise, you will have to deal with it like maybe five, ten years down the track. Yeah, and it's all just more get it up, done basically. now. Yeah. yeah, and and the other thing that helped me a lot is um, you don't have to do it publicly. Like mm. it's you can still do this very privately at home in journals or with very close friends or just with your partner or with a, a, a psych. You don't actually. No one needs to know. So if you're still really weird about the shame thing, you can just process it privately Mm. but uh does it help you be a great leader yes is it necessary yes is it common no Mm. um and i think this is where i get really passionate about people who are um emotionally intelligent Mm. people leading um because i think that's what makes a really good leader and a really good manager is like you have the ability to be empathetic Mm. um, but beyond that also help people navigate really challenging situations at work. Mm. Well, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is also like, what's the definition of like, I, I feel like the definition of leadership in in sort of the stereotype like Western society is sort of like the loud, sort of like extroverted, you know, like that classic type leader. And I think like quiet leadership is something that could be quite different and should in a certain way be normalized because thinking about um, say females or, you know, people of color and things like that, where we probably aren't that type. Like mm. we are much more analytical, we're more reserved, we sit back and we absor- we we look at situations and then decide what to do about them is again, could be perceived as um, either weak or passive or whatever the, the label is. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of like leadership styles? I actually don't have a super strong opinion on it. Yeah, mm. yeah I think, um, Everyone has their own style. Mm-hmm. And the best thing is if you f- find yourself working in an environment where the style works for the team, mm-hmm. that's to me, that's the only so thing. So it's to each their own again. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I think generally having diverse ways of leading is now very widely accepted and encouraged. So it's funny, yeah, I, I, I never actually never saw it the mm. way that you just did, like what you just said. I. Don't even, well, the I don't reason, even consider that. Well, I'm the reason like, why I say that is because I did corporate for such a long time. Yeah. I was never in startups, for example, where I, I feel like maybe startups was a little bit more progressive or you're working very closely very, with yes. a founder. Um, but, you know, classic corporate was, there was like your A type leadership. And often in my experience with many people, it was middle-aged, white or Caucasian male um, leadership. And it was very defined a certain mm. way it was. And when you're say, Asian and probably not that interested in what they're interested in that sort of stuff. And I've talked about this many times on the podcast. It's like, does that mean that I'm not leadership material? Mm. Yeah. You know, you start to question that and then it goes back to the self-limiting beliefs. Yeah, well, and also like seeing what yeah. you want to be, like seeing yourself, seeing exactly. a version yeah. of yourself. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. there was no one doing it. Yeah, well, mm. like leadership, uh, well, strong leadership is kind of like what you see in the army, right? Like you've got this strong mm. white male with power um, that's commanding over people and yelling real hard at people and mm-hmm. not being weak. And that's kind of like moved into, they, they use that a bit in, in corporate as well. Mm-hmm. And now I don't, like I'm starting to talk to the younger generation and I've hired, um, I'm not really younger generation. I am the younger generation. So I'm starting to understand that that doesn't really work with us. That's what I mean. We're yeah. so much more in tune with our emotions and we, uh, we need people to be m- more emotional. We need leadership, uh, leaders to understand and know what we're going through mm. for us to respect them. Mm. You know, you haven't been what we've been through. Even though I know it's been maybe been harder for you when you're older, 
or what you went through. Oh, sorry, when you were younger and what you went through in your old, your generation, they need to understand how what we're going through for us to respect them and lead them. And that's what I, I've noticed about the people I've worked with. And that's mm-hmm. why I think, and that's why I challenge you because I don't think a leader should be just strong and, you know, def- uh, and not, uh, not being in tune with the emotions with mm-hmm. their team. I think you need to understand the emotions and what you can say impacts them. It doesn't always have to be. Oh, uh, look, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I, yeah. I, maybe my, maybe I said it wrong, but I was like, mm-hmm. I was saying leadership in the sense that like, when shit hits the fan. <laughs> Yeah, I get what you mean. You don't want to be the one fucking screaming with your hair on fire as well. Like you're kind of people are looking yeah. to someone to steer the ship. They're looking for a leader to clarify, you know, but you can still be emotionally in tuned and that sort of stuff. I mean, yeah. I'm sure things go wrong in July all the time being a startup. But, you know, the, the thing is like the question that comes to my head is you said um, Rich and Aith actually believe more in you than you believed in yourself at the time. What was it that they saw in you? Did they tell you what they saw in you? And you were like, holy shit. I think they saw a lot of leadership and ability to set up processes and set up people for success. And I think that that's really what I'm good at. Like I really love doing that, like setting people up and then kind of just letting them run. Mm -hmm. And, and it's worked really well. Uh, Yeah. It's been quite rewarding. Mm. Would would you say that you're very much aligned with the culture in the, in July? Yes, I think so. So there's um, a few of us have been with the business for quite a long time and we never really like did it deliberately, but we just have this culture bec- that we've kind of carried on from the mm-hmm. start. Mm-hmm. Um, and we haven't even done like any exercises on naming, naming it. Um, we kind of just know it's what it f- is. It's, yeah, it's really <laughs> weird. Yeah, And so when you find out about these corporate businesses that have like these like values and things like that, it, <laughs> I find it really funny because I've never, I guess we, I did have a little taste of it, but to me it's such an organic um, soft skill thing that when you go through this like really weird workshops and exercises to try and name it, you kind of lose, you might lose its specialness. Yeah. I Obviously this is like, we're still a really small team so we can get away with it. But I understand as you get older, you need systems in place and no, but I to name things. Yeah. We, I think we are in agreement. Yeah. Like your thoughts are like doing the exercise is weird. It's really yeah, weird. I, I find it strange. Yeah. It's I, I, I did it. I did what are a, our values? I, I did a manager <laughs> strategy day uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And I was so weirded out by it because I think for us, and, and I, I, the reason why I asked you that I think you're very aligned with, uh, like, are you aligned with the culture? Is, and, and I kind of understand what, what your founders believe seeing you. Because there's this lady that works with me. Her name's Lisa. And she is, I call her the mother hen. And when I hired her, we were out and about, you know, at a rave, guys. We were at a rave. And then <laughs> I said to her- In case you missed it. Yeah, yeah I, just want, I just want people to know, because it's a funny story. And I just said, I want to hire you. Um, and I want you as my office admin. And as that time, at that time, we only had like three people. So you don't really need an office admin. But I just knew that there's so much potential in her because she is gonna, like, I don't have, the mental capacity when I'm running a business, looking at the numbers and all that stuff to deal with the culture of the of the um, business. And when I'm growing this thing and where it's all about people and people uh, that's gonna drive these things into like, you know, 10 times and because it's startup, I need someone that to care about us, not just the staff, but also me. Mm-hmm. I, need the, I need to rely on this person just to talk to, when things are going wrong in the business and just steer me in line and go, you know, David, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. And and I think I can see that in you. I'm, I'm only met you for like <laughs> half an hour, but I could see that. And when your founders, was, when you said stuff about like how your founder saw potential in you and I could kind of mm-hmm. see that. And and the, what you are saying right now, it's all about people. You, I yeah. don't, you've realized that everything about what you're saying right yeah. now is all about the relationships and the people that you have. Yeah. So I think um that you're a big, thing about the culture if you were disappearing out of july the culture will go down completely yeah i think it's for a lot of them yeah a lot of our senior team they are the backbone of the business and they form the culture mm, yeah. and it's yeah it, it's we've done a really good job yeah like and is it, it weird that like you just set the culture like you, you just go oh this is our I culture perfectly oh no i find that weird yeah that's strange. It's really I find it the weird, other way. yeah you, know, you just do and then as you do you form culture because it's with this weird, I don't know, like symbiotic 
I don't know, like it's, it's created, it happens. It created within the organization. Yeah, because so. it's what you do, it's what you say, it's yeah. like all the actions that you take. It's not like a he's this poster of our values, and it's like an acronym that turns into a word, like that kind of really yeah. um, corporate buzz. I always found that really strange. But then, to your point, you're like, well, maybe large organizations have a different problem. Mm-hmm. But I actually still think it's the same thing because it starts with the leadership. And then all the people who set the standards and it set, set the expectations around how we do things should be the culture. Mm. It's not about saying, oh, are you, have we hit these marks? It's, mm. a che- it's like a checklist. It's like a thing that you tick off the list. So I don't think it matters whether the organization is large or small. It's just harder when it's larger. So much harder. So much harder, right? Yeah. And you gotta, you got to have the right people in place. And then it goes back to like people and goes back to like the leadership and the seniors um, and things like that. I would argue like some of my guys, like if they leave the business, like maybe the culture is going to change for yeah. sure, you know, and then yeah. you have to, it's on you to keep everyone accountable as well. We have very clear um, things that we look for in interviews, which help us to foster and protect the culture. Mm-hmm. Like the first thing that we always look at, and, I, and we've been following this and it actually does work, is problem solving skills. So that's like the number one thing. Are they the type of person that's gonna Google something or will they ask you what's this, right? Mm. So are they the type of person where if you give them a problem that's in their skill set in their arena, they will like find that quite interesting and then they'll kind of pull that thread. If they don't show that um, spark or that interest and the eagerness to solve a problem that's relevant in their field, it's a huge red flag for me because I was, you know, you kind of need that mm. in a in a hustle bustle startup like ours. Uh, the other thing is um, I, a lot of people do this is just, do they pass a beer test? As in, would you actually enjoy having a beer with them one-on-one yeah. for like more than 30 minutes? Like, would you be, would you say this is the biggest drainer um, or like, this is actually quite fun. Yeah, right. And, and you have to be careful with how you assess that. You have to assess it fairly, assess it with a, you know, there is a rigor around how we do that, mm. um, but we, we follow it quite tightly. Um, and also just kind of, um, because we are a design based business and we're very product focused, do these people actually care about design? Yeah. So you could be hiring an accountant who would just be looking at our numbers, but we would still be like, do they have an appreciation for the design? Mm-hmm. Kind of like those three things, the problem solving one being major um, is has helped us yeah. like to go from 10 to 30 to now 60 mm. with relatively quite few issues. Yeah. yeah. I reckon um, Ken would uh, fail the beer test because he doesn't drink alcohol anymore. Sorry, yeah, coffee quit test. Alcohol. Alcohol. <laughs> the that's coffee good. test. That's good. That's, good. <laughs> that's even better. That means if, if we said yes, he'd be like, he doesn't even need alcohol. <laughs> He's that so cool. Bad. He's that exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you in terms of the recruitment process. Besides, obviously, the, you know, you call them the hard skills, it's the technical skills. Mm. Um, it is, for me, is all cultural fit like in many ways. And I don't know how to define that. I'm definitely not as rigorous as you guys are with that. It's still a process though. But yeah, it's like a innate thing in a lot of ways. You do interviews with people and you just, there's something, something clicks, something you know. Mm -hmm. And I used to, and I feel like some of the worst recruitment decisions I've made in my life are usually when I trust my head too much and not enough in the gut. Yes. Like it's like a feeling that you have after the interview and you're like, yep, this person might on paper or say the right things. And you're like, technically they can do the job but then there's something about them that's off and you're like, oh, I'm not sure if they'd be a good fit. And then you go ahead and you've recruited them anyway and it never, it never, never ends works up, out. never yeah. works out, never. Yeah. I um, I actually don't really um, look at the problem solving skill that much, mm. but maybe it's because I rely on the managers to um, work that out. To vet that out. Yeah, mm. but I also, um, maybe that's that's to my detriment, I, I don't think, I'm, I'm a good person at hiring. I think I'm terrible. He's definitely a terrible hire. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but because I'm, it's all about culture and if no, I- No, no, it's test. because- It's he, all about the beer test. He won't say this, but he's actually a very, um, he's a, he sees a lot of good in people. Oh, yeah. so, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. he's always yeah. like, you got potential. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think the, the generosity tends to overextend that gets himself into trouble. Yeah, I actually, the manager's, kind of don't like me uh, interviewing people at all. <laughs> and because I'm just like, you're hired. <laughs> sure you want money on a job, I gotcha. Just, How much money you want? You know okay. what it is? You're just very optimistic and you think the best yes, of everyone. And it's it. just like, so, there's far more benefit to that than negative, but the negative, yeah. I mean, as long as you bolster yourself with people who can watch out for that, it's yeah. not really a problem, <laughs> so, right? So we've got this yeah. rule where like, I'm not allowed to have the first interview, like not allowed. Oh, it's actually a rule now. Well, they, they don't let me do it because if, <laughs> if like, I do it, I'll hire job. them straight, yeah, I'll straight away hire them. 
Yeah. So uh, the, the like it unfortunately happened in like the last couple of months because everyone was busy and I'm like, yep, I'm hiring this person. Done. We're done. And <laughs> we're through this process. They were like, uh, Davey, did you, sure. offer, <laughs> did you offer him the job already? <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Well, I mean, the other thing I wanted to ask you was really, um, there was a particular note in here where you said three Asian women came to you at a conference where you were a panelist and they yeah. said they were very inspired, I guess, by you. Um, and, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's because seeing you as a female leader, you know, on stage, was that sort of the context behind it? Yeah, as a, like a, an Asian female. Yeah. Yes, it's actually happened a few times since mm. then. And yeah. you said you didn't know how to process it. Yeah, it was yeah. A, quite a shock, I guess, because I, I don't actually see myself, like I, I always forget that I'm Asian. Mm. I, that sounds so strange, but I guess mm. I have trained myself to not think about it as a thing. That's one thing that makes me, and in a professional setting, I have thought, taught myself to be like, that's not, like people don't look at that. Like you don't look at that. You you determine your success on merit. Like, you know, it's, I, I don't know, like it just kind of happened. And and um, and so when I like, I, I do a few speaking events or like in anything in a professional capacity, I kind of forget about it in a way. And I think it was just that, that there was three of them, they came up to me and they were like, it's so nice to see. They literally said something like, you're so nice to see an Asian woman on stage. Mm. And it just, I was so taken aback because I was like, wow. Um, yeah, I forget that that's how people see me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, wow. Like, and, and it's, and I, I was very touched because I was like, it's meaningful for them. Um, and um, I should not, I should actually remind myself that, um, I have the capacity to inspire in this way. I, in a way I had been neglecting that, I, I, you know, you're so focused on your work. Um, you kind of forget that you're in, we go around uh, full circle now where I am that person that can have the yeah, power exactly. to inspire yeah. others being like, yes, you're young, you're Asian, you're female, you, you can do it. Um, and it was just really, it was really touching. And it kind of, at that time, I, I'm so busy, like I, the business is growing so fast and I had considered pulling back on a lot more, um, like speaking, speaking ops business. because I was like, mm. I really want to be with the team. Mm. But um, I guess now I'm, I still do them and I am mm. far more selective um, because yeah, it's, if, you, if it's just one person that's like, oh my God, like that's amazing. Like an Asian woman on stage, why not? Right. Yeah. Um, that's me, my the younger version of me. Yep. Um, and in a way, like as a person, and if you become more and more successful and you're a leader, it's kind of your, not your responsibility, but it's actually one of the privileges that you have to inspire others in a position of leadership. Mm. But then yeah. you see it, like if you remember how you mentioned that uh, you had these limiting beliefs. Yes. And if you were younger and you saw you know, Asian or Asians on stage doing all that stuff and founding, uh, starting businesses, then you would be like, okay, yeah, I can do it too. Yeah. So yeah, that's why, and, and I agree like 100% that I even, I was like oblivious to it too. I didn't even think about it at all. I was mm -hmm. just, and when you were telling the story about how like uh, you wanted to work in startup and and you, you love the hustle and bustle of startup. I'm like, wow, like I didn't even realize that I did the exact same thing too. Like I'm 26 starting an accounting um, firm. And at that time, like I never really met an Asian um, running a business in accounting, mm -hmm. like where I, where I worked, like all the connections I made, there was no Asian partners or bosses in like big four accounting firms yeah. that I knew of. So I just, I was one of the first that did it. And I was like, what the heck? How did I start to decide to do that? I just went for it. I didn't even think about it. I was oblivious that I was Asian. I love that. Yeah. Mm. You're just, yeah, I'm just gonna do it. Yeah, I'm yeah. just gonna do it. Thinking I could do it because I thought I could do a better job. Yeah. Um, so I just yeah, went it wasn't and did because it. you were Asian. Yeah, I didn't even right? think about it at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. And then you kind of like reminded of it. Yeah. yeah. Like, and especially now. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I, like, uh, look, I'm not like trying to talk myself up, but like, I, I won this award and I was going up to stand there to give the speech and I was like, holy crap. I'm like the only Asian, one of the only Asians that received a, mm -hmm. an award tonight. Like it hits you sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing though. Cause you're, it's especially in moments like that. You're yeah. so proud. You're like, you know, yeah. especially wow. at events. I feel like events have this thing. Yeah. Cause you actually physically see who's in the room. Yeah. And maybe the diversity or lack of diversity sometimes. Yeah. And, and it hits you. Yeah. And you're like, mm -hmm. I'm 
the only Asian person here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes oh, I'm the only young Asian woman or young a yeah, woman. Like three, what woman? Three yeah. elements, right? It's quite intense. Um, but you just gotta reframe it and be like, that's right. Like instead of, oh my gosh, I'm the only one, it's yeah, that's right. That's why it's even more like important. You be here. This is why yeah, it's yeah. even more important for me to be here. Mm. Right. Um I'm still going through that journey. It's quite nice because I I do feel like it's special when you have moments um, like that. It reminds you of your ability to inspire. It's yeah. really, really nice For and sure. meaningful. And then the other aspect of being Asian was um, that TV show Pachinko. And book, actually. Well, it's originally it a book. It became a TV show, yes. right? On yes. Apple TV, yes. right? And you said you got really emotional you know, sort of consuming that. Yeah. Why is that? Yes, so I read Pachinko, I think it might've been during lockdown and uh, Pachinko is written by um, a Korean author who, um, Lee Min Jin, and um, she is a lawyer. And I think she spent about a decade, if I'm not wrong, writing this book. And it is essentially a historical fiction saga, like it, epic, sorry. It goes through three generations um, of a Korean family. Like it really impacted me reading it because – I, like I'm a huge reader um, of fiction and it was just one of the first times where I was like, wow, I feel so seen. I feel so seen. This is so nice. Like mm. this is an Asian family. Like I'm not Korean, but man, there's so much that I can relate to here. The themes, I guess the, the themes that um, the author touched on throughout the whole book were so um, vivid and um, relevant to me as a person. And you don't really get that in, well, I guess, you know, in a lot of books and um, it was multiple things. So it was like the themes that she touched on, um, the fact that it was multi-generational. So as a migrant, I really was like, wow, like, you know, the themes that came out from that. And she's just an excellent writer, obviously. So you just experience a full spectrum of emotions. And it's really, I, I count us as really lucky to be living in a time that we're living in because um, it's, we're, we're seeing more and more of us in mainstream media, mm -hmm. right? Like even if you take Bridgerton, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the um, newest season is just like, um, you're, it's just a standard plot and not written for a minority, but played by um, South Asians. Mm -hmm. Amazing, oh. like, but they're not fixated on the fact that they're South Asians, they're just normal people, which yeah. is how I think we should be represented. Mm -hmm. Like we're people first, you know? you see a lot of, there's so many Asian actors like killing it right now. Mm. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty sensational. Mm. And I think more and more of that is just going to help our next generations of Asians feel so empowered and just kind of achieve. It's, it's like that, um, uh, that movie on Netflix, Beef, when we yeah. watched it. Like it was so, so relatable, right? <laughs> Every, everything about it was like, you know, the, the, the phone uh, call with the dad. Yeah. Do you know with the phone call with the dad and the, the brothers in the back? <laughs> Do you know, in the first, yeah, it was just quite funny. Yeah. Oh man. It's also like the, just the anger and this, um, the negative parts of it as well, the mental illnesses and Or well, even the problems. relationship with his parents. Yeah. yeah. So, right. family, yeah. so many awkward well, moments. I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> like things like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the, the sibling love and relationships that they have, the stuff that they do to each other. It's just everything about it was so bloody relatable to not just Asian Australians or Asian Americans, but pretty much every Asian out there. So yeah, I, I just loved it. I loved sure. it so much. Right? And like, it's like one of those things where you like, you catch yourself, you're going like, why am I emotional about this thing? <laughs> cause it's like, yeah. you're like finally, cause you, you come to the realization that you're like, I've been consuming such maybe westernized media for such a long time that I think that's the norm. And all of a sudden there's something that's like super relatable when you see stories play out that you're like, oh, this happens in my family or this happens in my life. And you're like, holy shit, there's like people out there who actually go through the same thing as you do. Mm. And maybe it's the realization going that, oh, I'm not the only one potentially going through it, um, that you come to that sort of realization, just like everything else that we talked about, which is yeah. like, you know, being a leader, <laughs> you know, all of the bloody trauma and all the issues that we have. Um, yeah. yeah, overall. No, it's just like, it's, so this is how it feels to watch you know, movies that relate to you. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Yes, that's what I felt too. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh my God, is this what you, you guys Everyone else is crying. Things? You're like, why am I not crying? Yeah. And yeah. Like, yeah, because it's not relatable. Yeah. yeah. It's so insane, right? Mm. Yeah. Do you get that when you go back to Malaysia? Like just seeing things and you're just like- Oh, all the time. I had tried to go back a couple of times, right? Yeah. Um, I am like, I love being here and Australia is amazing, but um, I have always felt like, um, 
you know, there's still a part of me back in Malaysia, even though I left when I was like nine. Yeah. Um, Which is still a decent time. Yeah, but you know. A third of your life. Uh, yeah, I still feel um, not quite fully home here sometimes mm-hmm. um, in Australia only. And I don't actually, I, I still don't really know why, but when I go back, I feel really like, oh, but I, I still feel it's such a third culture thing, right? Yeah, like yeah. third culture kid thing. I go back, I still don't feel like I fit in there in Malaysia either. Mm. But um, yeah, there's just different versions of home. Yeah, I feel that way. Yeah. Um, I go back to China and I say this all the time. I'm like, there's something comforting about going, like stepping out of the airport. And then like everyone has the same habits as you. Everyone looks similar to either you or your family or your friends. Um, and the mannerisms, like probably the, um, as an example, like even just buying something from the store or even how you, cause I, I'm, I've always been taught to like, doesn't matter who it is, someone who's older than you, it's like uncle, auntie. Yeah. Something. Like the, the, the sort of um, the etiquette, which you don't get in Western society, you call everyone by their first names, mm. right? Um, I really love that stuff because I think it's just a form of not just respect, but also just like a term of endearment when you spend yeah. time and with people. And it's so special to the culture. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. we have that, you know, it's really nice. Yeah, and um, there's like some sort of pulling power there. It's cool that you guys have it. For me, I I don't know if I have it because my parents are born in Vietnam, but they're Chinese. I think you might, and maybe it's just a thought, you might need to go back to China where your parents are from to yeah. truly experience but they what don't, it is. They won't, they don't even, they don't talk to me about that stuff. Yeah. So the problem with my heritage is that it's cut off. They've cut it off. And I don't know why. As in they just don't talk past a certain point. Yeah. In the past. Yeah. Yeah. You Which know, it's really traumatic for yeah. them probably. Like there was wars. There's mm. reasons why they left. Mm. Yes. You know, China, they left China. Well, our grandparents left China because of war in China. Mm. And they went to Vietnam and, and my parents left Vietnam because of a war. And the crazy thing about this is that my, when I go back to Vietnam, my parents don't want me to meet my relatives. Why? Because of the trauma that they've been through and the things that like happened since then. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So, and I'm sure some, some families go through this and that's probably, probably why I want to talk about it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's so hard for, for us. And I, I kind of miss that, I, well, not miss it, I want that. Yeah. Want what you guys are talking about. I can relate to that. Yeah. yeah not it's necessarily like, war, but certainly I don't think, I, my parents don't, I don't know about your parents, but my parents don't really talk about anything beyond my grandparents. Like I don't know much beyond my grandparents. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. I don't even know anything beyond my, like my, beyond my parents in, in Vietnam. But I feel like that's all the more reason to then explore. Like I've got this sort I, of yearning yeah. to go back and actually explore my roots and yeah. trace them I do back. too, I do too. Right? I, I just think I need more headspace to do it. That's just- like, Oh yeah. Cause mm-hmm. like, there, there was just so many things. And uh, Vin, we had a um, chat to Vin. Do you, do you know who Vin is? No, but I've seen all him, a lot of yeah. content <laughs> with yeah. him. Yeah, so he's yeah. Vietnamese as well. And he was yeah. he, he told a story where his dad um, is, is such a good hearted man because he was giving money back always, constantly. Yeah. Like even if the family didn't have much. The thing is, in some Asian families is that when they give money back and, and my, our parents did the same, that, uh, it was sometimes it feels it feels like they were it was taken for granted, and that's what causes problems within the the uh, relationship, and and that's where my parents are worried that that I have to go through that as well, and so then hence why they just say, Davy, I don't think it's a good idea. Like maybe it's not a good idea. I don't want you. I don't want it to. I just want you to know them, but not no know them because if you know them like have a relationship yeah because it could it could come to you now they could be coming to oh, you I see. and then it's just like this weird relationship we have now so i want to go back and i want to like you know visit that and like try to find my heritage and know those stories or how my parents grew up and i see all these photos in the albums mm. and i just want to look at it and just go oh i want i want to know what that story that my parents have mm. but i'm scared of trying but you know, one day, know what's there. Yeah, and I think I need the he- mental uh, capacity and headspace to do it. Yeah. So that's why I probably- well, What about your, I, I mean, know. Malaysia, like, I mean, how does that, so how's the family situation play out over there? Like, no. you've just got extended relatives yeah. there. Yeah, mm. I have extended relatives, my mom's side, my dad's side, and we, yeah, we still stay in touch. We still talk to them. Mm. Um, it's quite common for their, them to send their children or for families to migrate to Australia. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, but we-, we we still stay quite close. My dad goes, my parents go back really often. Mm. I try and go back as often as I can. I'm very fortunate because I, I don't think um, like we, there's, we probably did go through wars, but not 
in my my parents didn't go through that and, and I Brilliant certainly haven't yeah so we've healed like we've healed from that trauma I think mm-hmm. like but yeah I, I do really like going back and I think if I can say I would say a lot of people especially first generation migrants like when they come to Australia you're forced to assimilate otherwise you get bullied um so you kind of for some time it's quite normal for a lot of children to shed their Asian-ness mm. you kind of deny it completely and I think it's it's really sad but well, like quite common and um sometimes I've observed in friends that they just haven't come around back to it and acknowledged and embraced it yep. uh, and I really think I mean it's not for me to say but I found a lot from actually doing that myself being mm. like no oh, like you know my Malaysian roots are actually really important mm. like it is so it's formed the foundation of who I am mm. of course uh, when you want to yeah. have kids as well yeah you yeah probably ask yeah. that question. think about the impact yeah and yeah. it's not so much family yeah family's huge but it's mostly like just the culture like what what are the hallmarks of a Malaysian culture right food is huge for most cultures and most Asian cultures but like what about the food what you know it's interesting to kind of go deeper and deeper into it. I guess the last question I had was just really around advice, you know, for people who might be aspiring to do something either similar to you or sort of see themselves in you. So much like, you know, sort of the Asian women who approached you um, at these conferences and things like that. So do you have sort of any like words of wisdom, any advice for anyone like that? One of the themes I guess we covered is the, the fact that a lot of everything in, in my life hasn't felt very linear or very conventional at all. And I think a lot of that is being quite opportunistic. So, um, so it, there's two elements to this, right? It's firstly developing an attitude of being opportunistic and saying yes to things and like exploring how things can look in different thing, like in different ways, um, on different paths, how li- your life can change. And so that's the first thing. So stay open to opportunities. Don't, don't just believe that things have to be linear and conventional. Um, explore and, um, and investigate. The second thing is, um, and I found this really helpful in my 20s, is see your life in decades, not in years. I mean, you underestimate how much you can achieve in a decade and you overestimate how much you can achieve in a year. And I think when you see your life in decades, what we're in our thirties, I yep. think you're, yeah, yeah. Um, we're I'm like I'm thirty, yeah, yeah, we're in our thirties, so you're actually kind of not even halfway there. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah, I feel crazy, like I've right? done a lot, but you're actually not even halfway there. Like I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, you know, I, like, and, I feel like I'm and just so getting started. You, like yeah. you really gotta. I, I guess it gives you so much perspective, like how mm. to make decisions, and also the weight that you give to your decisions. Mm. Like you often give it too much weight to decisions. You think that you're like, life's gonna get ruined if you screw this decision up. Mm. Actually, probably not, mm. you know? So uh, like kind of step back a bit and give you a bit of perspective if you look at things in a decade. And then, sorry, that's, that's the second thing. So mm. first thing was being very opportunistic and open-minded. Second thing was um, see, like think of your life in decades, not years. And then the third thing I found, um, especially recently is um, the importance of momentum. Mm -hmm. It can work both ways, positively and negatively. Um, Sometimes you just need a break. Like uh, um, you, so if you're going through a bad patch, you want to force yourself to have a win, even if it's small, and then try and get the momentum for good things to continue to happen. Right. And a lot of that is like mindset, right? Mm. Um, So you can just keep bringing good things. Everyone has different ways of doing this, but you need to find a way to, um, what do you call it? Like um, just cut, just cut the the negative mm-hmm. negativity, especially if you're finding that the negativity is gaining momentum. There's a lot of bad shit happening. Yeah. You know, you might be very spiritual spiritual and go and do something about that in that way, but yes. you might have more physical ways of like other other ways of doing it. And it's also the positive um, on the positive side. If you have you're having lots of wins, keep it up and be really conscious that you're you've gotten momentum um, and to keep going and keep fostering it and don't stop essentially so yeah that's that's changed my life having that attitude 
You got anything else? You want ah, to that's really great words of movies. Yeah, I love that last one particularly because yeah. mm. it's like I think you sometimes we sometimes get it's a circuit breaker. Cliche. That's what it's called. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Like, circuit break. Yeah, you know, sort of just cut it off um, before yeah. it sort of rips in and becomes you know too much as well. Mm. Um, and I was going to say like a lot of advice sometimes can be quite cliche, but that was something I've never heard of before. Mm. Yeah, um, which is amazing. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for um, having me. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way to connect with you? Probably online? on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, Zoe Lowe on LinkedIn. DM me. Yeah. DM, slide into DMs. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for coming on the show, Zoe. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. A lot of work and effort goes into Level Asian with a whole team behind the scenes. While we aren't looking for anyone to pay for this content, what helps the podcast grow, reach more people, and benefit more Asians around the world is if you could leave a five star review if you're on Spotify. Apple, Google, or any other audio platforms. And leave us a like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Catch you on the next episode.